Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Okay, members, if I can just remind you to do the needful with your mobile phones, and uh, the evidence sessions will be recorded by Hansard. They're doing that uh, by watching uh, proceedings rather than being in uh, the room. Uh, again, just remind members any declarations of interest to do so now. If not, then apologies from Linda Dillon, Deputy Chair, and Emma Rogan, and I haven't heard from Paul Frew, so I assume he'll be in uh, shortly. Uh, this is to consider the LCM on the uh, cor coronavirus bill. Pages 5 to 27 of your meeting pack is the relevant information. The LCM was laid uh, on the 19th of March, and officials are here to outline the justice-related provisions uh, to the bill and to answer questions uh, from members. The Department has advised that there will be additional clauses regarding prisoner releases in the bill. Uh, a paper on the proposed clauses has been tabled, and there's officials from the prison service who will be uh, in attendance to outline them. Two officials will come to the table at a time uh, to outline the provisions in the bill uh, related uh, to the evidence that we're, we're having. So we've set the mics up. We'll have two immediately at the committee, and then we've got two others uh, sitting behind in terms of trying to comply, uh, which we are with the social distancing policies that are in place in the uh, Assembly. Uh, so let me welcome... Uh, Doreen McClintock, Head of Operations and Resilience Planning, Moira Campbell, Deputy Director of Policing Policy and Strategy Division, Jane McGuire, who is Head of Family Courts and Tribunals Branch, Claire Irvine, Head of Judiciary and Mental Health Capacity Branch, Civil Justice Policy Division, and Alan Smith, Deputy Director of the Northern Ireland Prison Service, uh, to the meeting. Uh, members, the uh, proceedings will be recorded uh, by Hansard. So I'm going to initially now hand over to, I think it's Doreen and Moira. Uh, for their elements of the presentation, and then members will have questions, and then I'll uh, invite uh, Jane and Claire to, to comment at that stage. D Doreen and okay, thank, thank you. you to the committee for accommodating this morning's meeting, so that we can provide a more detailed update to you on the measures within the coronavirus bill that relate to justice and policing functions. I'm grateful to my policy colleagues for joining me this morning, and we'll try to answer any questions that the committee members may have. Um, you are all aware of the evolving situation and have previously been provided with a high-level overview of some of the measures that might be included in the draft bill to allow us to better manage the response to coronavirus. The bill is today being debated on the floor of the House of Commons and tomorrow will be subject to a legislative consent motion here in the Northern Ireland Assembly. We all understand the fears and uncertainties people face given the risks to their health, to their loved ones and to their livelihoods. The emergency bill gives us the powers we need to take the right action at the right time to respond effectively to the progress of the outbreak. Our focus today is specifically on the provisions in the bill that relate to justice functions in Northern Ireland. Although the bill covers the functions of many other departments, most notably those with responsibilities for health and social care, who are leading on its development. The bill is targeted at delivering only those new measures that are considered to be necessary and that could only be provided by primary legislation. They are temporary and proportionate to the threat we face. They will only be activated on the basis of scientific advice and will only be in place for as long as is clinically necessary. The bill allows the four governments across the UK jurisdictions to switch on these powers when they are needed and, crucially, to switch them off again when they are no longer necessary. The measures in the bill fall into five broad categories. Measures to contain and slow the virus, such as isolation powers, powers for police and immigration officers, or powers to close schools. Measures to increase the available health and social care workforce, such as allowing for the temporary registration of suitable health and social care staff, or allowing retired staff with the right skills to return to the workplace without impacting on their pensions. Measures to ease the legislative and regulatory requirements, and therefore the burden on frontline staff and some of the justice measures fall into this category. Measures to allow us to manage the deceased with respect and dignity, which I'll return to in more detail, and measures intended to provide support to people, such as allowing employees to claim statutory sick pay from the first day of absence and supporting the food industry to maintain supplies. The powers relating to policing and justice functions will help to alleviate the administrative burdens relating to justice functions in the event that widespread absences related to the spread of COVID-19 reduce our capacity to deliver those functions. They include specific measures relating to coroners and inquests, 
to relax requirements relating to notifications to the coroner in cases of death from natural illness or disease to clarify that there is no requirement for a jury inquest in relation to a death from COVID-19 and to provide that there is no requirement for a jury inquest in relation to a death in prison from natural illness. There are also amendments to the Mental Health Northern Ireland Order and the Mental Health Capacity Act that will allow greater flexibility in a situation where medical staff may be unable to carry out their usual functions due to pressures caused as a result of coronavirus. These include extensions to the time limits during which a person may be remanded in hospital and modifications relating to the medical evidence required by a court in certain circumstances, for example, before making a determination of unfitness to plead or a direction for recording a finding that a person is not guilty by reason of insanity. The bill also provides powers for courts and tribunals in Northern Ireland to direct the use of live links in respect of participation in any court or tribunal proceedings where the court determines that this to be in the interest of justice. It also provides for public participation in proceedings where live links are used through a power to direct that proceedings be broadcast and creates new offences relating to unauthorised recording or transmission in relation to such broadcasts. It also specifically provides for the availability of live links in relation to appeals brought in respect of any requirement or restriction made relating to the containment powers provided for in the bill for the avoidance of any doubt about these new proceedings. The bill also includes powers of direction to enable local government to direct private providers in the death management industry, so for example funeral directors, mortuaries and crematoriums, individuals and services to get them to implement a central plan. These powers are intended to improve throughput to streamline the system at every stage up to burial or cremation. They are sensible precautionary powers that we need to provide for in the event of a worst case scenario. In addition to these powers, we are taking precautions to prepare for the risk that the normal burial arrangements are not sufficient. In doing so, we will do all we can to ensure dignity for the deceased and for their families. We must also safeguard public health. In the event that the virus hits Northern Ireland very hard, then we have seen elsewhere in the world that this gives rise to challenges which we are working to meet. The bill will also provide the police with additional powers to support actions taken by the relevant health authorities to prevent the spread of the coronavirus. These will enable the police to enforce sensible public health restrictions, including returning people to isolation and, where necessary, directing individuals to seek relevant treatment or attend suitable locations for further help. We previously briefed you on the potential for the bill to include provisions that would have allowed for the early release of certain fixed-term prisoners. These provisions have been a late addition to the legislation. Um, they will provide the DOJ with powers to be able to reduce Northern Ireland's adult prison and juvenile <coughs> justice centre population to ensure that any reduction in service caused by staff shortages due to coronavirus can be counterbalanced by the reduction of the population that needs to be managed and in doing so continue to be able to provide safe and secure custodial environments. The bill is drafted so that it will expire automatically two years after it has passed with some exceptions, so for example provisions relating to the emergency registration of nurses, healthcare workers, pharmacists and social workers. The bill also provides powers for ministers to suspend or revive the operation of any provisions in it by regulations. These can be exercised by UK government ministers but only with the consent of Northern Ireland ministers insofar as they relate to functions that have been devolved to Northern Ireland and the powers are also exercisable by Northern Ireland ministers themselves, where they relate to functions that have been devolved. <coughs> there is also a power to extend any provision within the bill for a maximum period of six months. Again, this power can be exercised by UK government ministers, but only with the consent of Northern Ireland ministers. We previously advised the committee that given the urgency it was possible that the legislation would be made without seeking the legislative consent of the Assembly, however recognising the role of the Assembly in scrutinising these important legislative powers that will affect Northern Ireland, an LCM has now been prepared. You should have already received a copy of our input to that process um, and the, the motion will be debated in the Assembly tomorrow. I appreciate that this opening statement has been quite lengthy, um, but we wanted to give committee members as comprehensive an overview of the provisions in the bill as possible, and we'll seek to answer any questions that you might have. <clears throat> Doreen, thank you, and I appreciate uh, the overview, and again, I appreciate the pressure the department's under and uh, the environment that you're having to work in, so um, we thank you and commend you for, for that. Ju just a, 
a, a query on the prisoner aspect of this. Um, how is that being incorporated into the LCM? So that, um, Alan will speak to you in more detail, but that was a late amendment which came in after, um, just over the weekend, um, and that's going to be um, added as an amendment to the LCM. Okay, so that, that, that is still to be tabled, but will be tabled today? Yes. yes. And will be put through tomorrow? Yes. In conjunction with the overall LCM, but I take it the Justice Minister will need to then deal with the amendment rather than the Health Minister? from a procedural point of view, or can that just be incorporated into the current health LCA? My understanding is it'll be incorporated, but... I think so, yes. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, Moira, rather than just some of these questions, other folks will be able to deal with rather than me question just at the minute. So, Moira, do you want to take me through the policing side of things? Certainly, Chair. Thank you. Um, the policing powers, which are contained at um, Schedule 20 of uh, the Bill, Part five are primarily focused on enabling the police, and that includes the airport and harbour police, as well as PSNI, <coughs> to support medical professionals where that's necessary. Uh, though in the vast majority of cases, we don't anticipate the need to use them will arise. They're there as a sensible, proportionate precaution. Any actions taken by the police in response to coronavirus uh, will, of course, be in line with their existing legal responsibilities and will be used to protect life and keep our community safe. And the usual accountability arrangements for the police will continue to apply. Uh, the policing powers uh, will enable the police to enforce sensible public protection restrictions. That includes uh, returning people to isolation, um, where a person suspected of having coronavirus refuses to follow instructions of the public health agency and presents a risk to public safety. Uh, it's uh, to allow them to be um, returned to isolation or detained uh, so that they can uh, be assessed or uh, be provided with the, the necessary treatment. Um, the powers will only be exercisable during a transmission containment period, which is declared by the Department of Health. And uh, I would stress that at all times the police will be guided by the expert advice from our health professionals. Um, there are some uh, appeal mechanisms included in the legislation and there are separate provisions in relation to children where some of the uh, powers will be exercised through a responsible adult. Okay, thank you. Um, Jane? Do you want to talk through your aspect of it? Uh, yes, uh, Chair, thank you. Um, I'm dealing with the provisions relating to coroners and inquests. Uh, so uh, the bill uh, modifies a number of provisions in the Coroners Act, Northern Ireland, 1959. Uh, there, there are three uh, provisions. I'll just take you through each of those uh, briefly. Uh, the first one is actually... Um, the substantive part of it, it's linked to Clause 17, but the substantive part is found in Schedule 12, Part 3, Paragraph 26. And uh, the, the effect of that um, is that a death from natural illness or disease will not have to be reported to the coroner, even if the deceased has not been seen by a doctor within 28 days uh, prior to death, provided that a doctor can sign a death certificate under the revised death certification provisions in the bill, in particular in, in paragraph um, 24. Uh, so, so under those provisions, um, a doctor will be able to sign a death certificate if the deaths from natural illness, if they can uh, state the cause of death to the best of their knowledge and belief, even if they haven't actually treated the deceased uh, in the 28 days prior to their death, uh, ordinarily if a deceased hadn't been seen by a doctor in the 28 days uh, prior to death, that, that death would have to be reported to the coroner. So the purpose of the provision uh, really is to uh, reduce the number of deaths that need to be reported uh, in order to ensure that, that coroners don't become over, overburdened. Uh, the second uh, provision then is found in clause 29. Uh, so, uh, Coronavirus or COVID-19 has already been made a notifiable disease under the Pel Public Health uh, Northern Ireland Act 1967. Uh, and the reason is that really is to do with public health reasons. So to allow um, accurate data 
uh, to be captured and to enable contact tracing. It's not for reasons relating to uh, scrutiny after death. Uh, now, ordinarily, an inquest into a notifiable disease would have to be held with a jury. Uh, so the effect of this provision is that where an inquest is to be held, and it appears to the coroner that the death um, is caused by coronavirus, then it uh, disapplies the requirement for an inquest with a jury. So there will still be an inquest. There's just no need uh, to, to have a jury. Uh, and again, that's really to help um, to mitigate the, the, the impact on, on coroners and uh, also to avoid delay uh, in the inquest um, process. Uh, but importantly, uh, a coroner would still have discretion uh, to hold a jury inquest where they consider that this is appropriate. And then uh, thirdly, clause 30, which relates to uh, deaths in prison from natural illness. It's not dissimilar uh, to clause 29 um, in that uh, the effect of it is to disapply the requirement for an inquest to be held with a jury. Um, so there, there's a statutory requirement in the Prison Act, Northern Ireland, 1953, for there be, to be an inquest into every death in prison. And uh, ordinarily, um, under uh, Section 18 of the Coroners Act, um, that inquest has to be held with a jury. So uh, this provision will enable an inquest into a death in prison from natural illness uh, to be held without, without a jury. Um, and again, that will help to uh, mitigate the, the potentially quite significant impact on, on coroners uh, and coroners uh, and the inquest process and uh, to, to reduce delay as well by enabling uh, the inquest to be opened sooner. And uh, again, importantly, uh, a coroner would still have the discretion to hold uh, the inquest with the jury uh, where they consider it um, appropriate. Uh, but... Um, so the other point is that uh, in relation to both those clauses is that during a pandemic it, it actually could be quite difficult to convene a jury due to um, a high level of sickness amongst the general uh, population and that having a jury convened might in itself create um, difficulties in terms of, of the risk and social distancing and so on. Okay, thank you, Jane. Claire. Thank you. <coughs> um, I have sort of two aspects of the bill um, which I'll talk to you about this morning. Um, the first aspect is mental health and mental capacity. Um, clause 9 and Schedule 9 in relation to mental health and Schedule 10 in relation to mental capacity um, <coughs> make some modifications to the Mental Health Northern Ireland Order 1986 and the Mental Capacity Act Northern Ireland 2016. The basic thrust of these modifications is to take a bit of pressure off the health service at a time when obviously it will be very busy dealing with other matters. Um, in relation to the mental health order, um, <coughs> really, Doreen alluded to earlier, two main, um, two main policy objectives. First of all, to um, increase by a moderate amount, um, time periods for carrying out various functions under the Act. And secondly, in relation to various functions under the Act, to decrease the amount of medical evidence which is needed in order to satisfy the court. Um, in relation to mental health order, um, paragraphs 9 through to 14 of Schedule 9 basically detail the various uh, modifications that are made. In relation to Schedule 10, we haven't actually commenced those parts of the Mental Capacity Act that are being modified um, by Schedule 10. However, we did commence work on this quite some time before this immediate need arose. And um, at that time, when we were drafting these provisions, um, we took the view that we would include them because they might prove useful, given that commencement of, of this particular act would take place in due course. We've included them in the bill just for completeness, but it's important to note that those actually have no legal effect for now. Um, in relation to the mental health and mental capacity clauses, more so the mental health obviously because they're the ones in force, clause 73 deals with commencement. These clauses are not to come into force in royal assent but rather to be commenced by Minister of Crown with the consent of the Northern Ireland Department um, or indeed a Northern Ireland Department if they have the legis legislative competence to deal with those clauses which in this case we do. Obviously, we have a very close relationship with the Department of Health in relation to mental health and the mental health order. And rather than create a very complex commencement provision within this act or within this bill, 
it's been agreed that we'll discuss between us who actually makes the commencement if a commencement of these provisions is indeed needed. Mm -hmm. um, the second area is in relation to video links and audio links for courts and devolved tribunals in Northern Ireland, and that's Clause 55 and Schedule 26. Now, courts are slightly further ahead than a number of tribunals in Northern Ireland in that there are already some provisions within various bits of legislation to deal with uh, the ability of courts to hear um, proceedings by video link. Tribunals, well, we had to take a view on tribunals because some are slightly more modern, others slightly less so. So the first part of Schedule 26, you'll see that we're taking a broad approach um, to allow basically courts and statutory tribunals to be able to use other forms um, of communication other than the oral hearing, which we're all mostly familiar with. Now that will include criminal courts, civil courts, um, statutory tribunals, and also coroners. Um, in order to make sure that we don't offend against our Article 6 um, obligations to ensure um, you know, public hearings, um, there are provisions created to allow for the broadcast of video links and audio hearings to obviously allow people to enjoy open justice. And then we also create offences in relation to the unlawful recording or transmission in, in relation to that broadcasting. Um, we have chosen to insert various clauses into the Judicature Act, Northern Ar or the Judicature Northern Ireland Act 1978, um, just to keep everything <coughs> in the one place as best we can. Um, you'll notice to um, part three of Schedule 26, strictly speaking, that is already covered by part one and part two. But it also is quite useful because it draws out some um, new magistrates' court proceedings, which are particularly um, in relation to public health on the bill. Yeah, thank you. Um, Alan, could you swap with maybe Claire just, um, yeah. just so that we can get the recording of it picked up? Uh, if you want to just take us through, I think you're dealing with the prison prisoner element of this. Okay. Uh, in broad terms, uh, the new clauses confer a power in the department to direct that certain fixed-term prisoners be released early in response to the coronavirus epidemic. When I briefed you on the 20th of February, I indicated that the coronavirus bill would include powers to release some categories of prisoners early during what was termed an emergency period. We learnt towards the end of February that this was to be dropped with UK prison services relying instead on existing release powers. We learnt then on Saturday afternoon uh, passed that the Lord Chancellor had decided to reintroduce specific early release provisions, this time directly and specifically linked to coronavirus. We saw merit in readopting a four nation approach. We still believe we have sound existing powers, but specific coronavirus related powers will be better and more robust from a public presentation perspective, particularly when these powers are uniform and consistent right across the UK and each nation isn't using different powers, albeit with the same objective and effect in mind. Just to reiterate, we will now have specific powers to direct the release of certain fixed-term prisoners for the specific purpose of preventing, protecting against, delaying or otherwise controlling the incidence or transmission of coronavirus, or facilitating the most appropriate deployment of personnel and resources in prisons in Northern Ireland. This will provide us with a robust basis on which to work. So what do the new clauses say? As explained above, the new clauses provide for the Department of Justice to make an early release direction for the purpose of preventing, protecting against, delaying or otherwise controlling the incidence or transmission of coronavirus or facilitating the most appropriate deployment of personnel and resources in Northern Ireland. The direction will apply to those fixed term prisoners who fall within a description specified by the department. The DOJ will have authority to frame this description as it sees fit, so certain offences will be able to be excluded, for example, sexual domestic violence and other serious offending. Before making an early release direction, the DOJ will be required to satisfy itself that doing so is a necessary and proportionate action in response to the incidence or transmission of coronavirus. 
Fixed term prisoners are defined as those determinate custodial sentence prisoners who would ordinarily be released automatically on licence at the halfway point of their sentence under Article 17 of the Criminal Justice Northern Ireland Order 2008. Those in custody who have previously been recalled after such a release, those detained in pursuance of a juvenile justice centre order, those recalled for breaching such an order, those detained for fine default and those imprisoned for contempt of court. Just to be clear, extended custodial sentences, indeterminate custodial sentences and life sentences are not included. Those released early will be released on licence. The total length of sentence, that is the custody plus the licence, will be the same. The licence period will just be brought forward into the custody element. The same applies to juveniles released early. Their period of supervision will simply commence earlier. Those fine defaulters and those convicted of contempt of court released early will be deemed as discharged with no supervisory element or licence in place. In the absence of specific release provisions in this bill, we had planned to use Prison Rule 27 to release certain prisoners temporarily. This would not have involved supervision. However, those now released early will be subject to supervision by Probation Board, although, as I understand it, there may be a late amendment this morning to remove the duty to impose certain standardised conditions and to replace that with the power to impose them. So that could give us flexibility on the supervision point. Um, and finally, the department will be required to publish its early release direction. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll maybe just stick with you, Alan, saying as it's fresh in my mind, on the, the prisoner aspect of it, the, the four-nation approach mm -hmm. that's being taken. Yes. How does that tally with the approach the Republic of Ireland is taking in respect to prisoner release? Is there a differential? Uh, in terms of... Uh, the way they're, releasing, they're prisoners. releasing prisoners. I'm not sure what their okay. plans are. This has been this has been so quick over the weekend that we've had to work quickly to catch up with where the rest of the United Kingdom is. So I haven't turned my mind yet to how the Republic of Ireland are dealing with prisoner releases. Okay, uh, I'm speaking to the Justice Minister over the weekend. I understand that they're letting people out on the last 12 months of their sentence, irrespective of the nature of their crime. Right. That's why I'm asking. Well, that's a different direction. approach altogether from it the approach is, yes. we're adopting. Um, so I just want to be satisfied then that the specified nature of offences that are being considered, that's things like fine defaulters, financial crime, not crimes that relate to public safety. Um, and you've highlighted a number of them in terms of offences that won't be considered. That's right. It's, all, it's, it's that nature of it. Yes. In terms of the process, the powers will or for the Northern Ireland Prison Service, are they able to take that decision on their own? Um, or is the department part of the decision-making process and the minister? The power is vested in the department, so we will be taking the view of the minister on, on anything we do. So any prisoner that's going to be released, so just so that I know, um, that'll have to be by way of application from the prison service to the department and to the minister to sign off on? I don't think it'll be on a case-by-case -case basis like that. I think we'll draw up broad definitions of those, we'll release them and apply those definitions as we see fit then thereafter. Okay, and the pressure then on the probation board, I take it the concern is obviously it's an organisation that will be impacted, mm -hmm. you know, like any other organisation, uh, and so putting a duty on the probation board in certain circumstances may not be actually enforceable or implementable. We'll not want to add to the Basin Board's burden at this time at all. And as I said, there's an, there's an amendment late this morning, uh, that just came in overnight, that will remove the duty for us to impose standard conditions and replace that with the power to impose standard conditions. So there's flexibility there in terms of what we ask mm -hmm. probation to do. Okay, members, before I touch on any other aspect, I want to try and contain members' questions to the specific area so that we get a structure to it. So anyone that wants to ask a question on prison, and then I'll come back and lead on the next subject and open it up again is how I intend to do it. So uh, if anyone's questions on the prison, Patsy, and then Doug, and then Jim. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chair, and thank you for, for your time here this morning. It's <coughs> extraordinary times. Um, just to get back to the prisoners issue, I raised this with Ronnie Armour last week, the practicalities of this, and that's the many people, I think it's 55%, suffer from either addiction, mental health problems, who are in 
the prison service, or sorry, within the care of the prison service. Um, if those people are released early, um, I'm just wondering what kind of support packages will be out there, what sort of tech tacking will be done to ensure that they're just not dumped as it would be into society mm -hmm. and no uh, corresponding support there for people with the health service which is going to be under increasing pressures anyway. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm just wondering to what, if you like, cushion is there to prevent against a difficult and trying and very bad situation becoming even worse by early release of people who have uh, health problems and some quite severe health problems and some prone, as you will know, to self-harming and uh, suicidal ideation. So that, that's the first thing. Um, the, the second thing is then uh, to bring it back to the prison service and indeed the, the PSNI and those who are fall within the, the care of um, the department. <coughs> Testing for staff mm -hmm. and people who are your employees. Um, this has become a huge issue within the health service. So I'm just wondering what measures have been taken at departmental level uh, to ensure that for vital key workers, include uh, the prison service and the PSNI, what mechanisms are in place to ensure delivery of that um, within those respective services? Because from what I'm hearing within the health service, that's quite a significant issue at the moment. And they are really the frontline people who are delivering, but as to um, police and prison are key workers and indeed provide a vital service at any time, but particularly at the times we're coming into. So I'm wondering uh, if there's any response to that or what thinking and action maybe has been going on at the department around those issues. I'll deal with your first point first. Um, we will ensure wherever possible that there's a smooth transition from custody to the community in terms of medical intervention and support along with our partners in the South Eastern Trust. And that's as much as I can say that on that at the minute. In terms of testing of staff, um, we will work with our healthcare partners and the health and the health service to ensure that whatever um, uh, testing is in place for emergency care workers at the prison service, staff will be involved with that. You're saying we will has there not been any work done already with them to ensure that, that testing and testing sources has been because you've won very, very close to, to one of the prisons of Odad mm -hmm. um, uh, at Randox there. So uh, I'm just wondering, has there not been anything done within the department around this already? I'll surprised. need to get back to you not, Pat, because yeah, I, don't, please, I don't have first-hand knowledge of that. Do. And then there, there is another issue on the earlier prison release thing. And again, um, I saw there that um, supervision by the probation board, well, that's going to be extremely difficult in the climate that we're facing in mm -hmm. already. Um, so that's going to be, if you like, a hypothetical situation. But um, one of the other things is the description by the department of, um, if you like, the offences that people have been imprisoned for. And then uh, you mentioned publishing an early release direction. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, A, depend upon the description of the offences, B will be the issue of um, victims of some of those crimes. Now I'm not sure because I don't know what the descriptions are, you outlined some of them earlier there, but if there are particular crimes where it has been a victim, that it, it could be traumatic for that victim. I'm just wondering what type of, uh, what should be normal practice in, in any event, uh, what type of, uh, again, disclosure of information can there be where there has been a particularly sensitive case and where there has been a victim who might be surprised, shocked and indeed traumatised to see the perpetrator of the offence against them maybe uh, walking down the street mm -hmm. um, in, in uh, the new circumstance. But I, I'm wondering just w what provision has been made within that, that uh, change of legislation there too, where there are traumatic circumstances. With all prisoner releases, um, if there's a victim registered with the Prisoner Release Victim Information Scheme, that person will receive the same information they would receive if that person had been released at the normal release point. So that will continue? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. But, um, thank you. <coughs> Thanks, Chair. Okay, thank you. Just, I'm, I'm going to bring Dugan, Dugan next. If I can just encourage members, this is about legislative provisions and schedules yes. and avoid the commentary around you know, you'll have an opportunity in the Assembly. We want to get what does this legislation mean? 
uh, what's its implication. So if the questions can be very specific and pointed and not preambled with a load of commentary around it, otherwise we're going to run out of time before the Assembly starts. So just with that note, if members can bear that in mind, Doug. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I'll, very difficult, what you're going through at the minute. Um, I have concerns about the criteria for the release of prisoners, um, what that criteria will be, because um, I, I do not want to be adding to the burden of the health service by releasing people out who then have to go straight to the health service, what Patsy said. Um, uh, will you be releasing a criteria in regards to your decision making in regards to, in regards to this? Yes, as the legislation says, we are required to publish what our direction is, so it will be, it'll, it'll be opening up. up up front and publicly available, it'll, it'll set out the criteria. Right. Well, and, and, and there's a difference between direction and criteria. So yes. it's a, as long as the direction contains the criteria, then, yes, well. then, then I'm happy enough. And, and, and when they then look at those people who they release, that they can then say, and you will automatically go into isolation. Is that something you have considered? Uh, not yet, but that's certainly going to be in the mix. Um, the other question I've got is about supervision. I, I did raise the issue about the probation board last week and its capacity. Mm -hmm. um, I did raise it a couple of weeks ago about its capacity as well. Has nothing been done to increase the capacity of the probation board so they can do online supervision? I think they intend to do all supervisions at the, in the minute with certainly the low um, risk prisoners by telephone. That's, that's the latest I heard at the end of last week. And I think they intend still to have face-to-face -face contact with those more dangerous offenders who they're supervising in the community. But I don't see us adding to that burden with this particular direction. Okay. Um, politically motivated offenders, PMOs, are they going to be part of this or are they going to be exempt from it? Under, under Article 19, which we'll draw on in terms of those who will release uh, those convicted of terrorist offences are excluded from early release under Article 19, so I see some read across into this direction as well. Okay, uh, and, and finally, Alan, for the, for the Northern Ireland Prison Service, I believe you are starting a training course today for 20 officers. Um, is that not against advice that's been given about... I need to take advice on that, Doug. I mean, uh, all things are up in the air, I would think, from today as, as the situation we're living in changes by the hour almost, so I think I'm <coughs> sure that that will be something we'll have to reflect on. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, and thank you for that approach, Doug. Um, Gemma. Thanks, Chair. Thanks very much, Alan. Um, just a quick question, and you might not actually know this, but have you any idea of the numbers of prisoners this might apply to, or that this might affect? Ballpark in terms of those who it could apply to. Now, I'm not saying this is that these are the numbers. This, yeah. is, the, this is the raw data, yeah. around 700. Okay. But that's anybody who's convicted of a determinate yeah. custodial sentence. Within that, there'll be a large number who'll be excluded because yeah. of the offences they've committed. Yeah, no, no problem with that. Thank you. Thank you. I said 700. <laughs> okay. But you said 700 mm. getting out. I said there are 700 you know, no, I, yeah. who yeah. could, yeah. but there's a, a large number will be excluded mm -hmm. from that. Yeah. That's an important point. Rachel? Um, all of my questions have been answered. Okay, thank you, and thank you for that approach. Same me, all my okay. questions. Um, can I jump to um, Moira in terms of the, the, the policing aspects of this? You indicated, if I picked you up right, that the trigger mechanisms here for having to enforce people into isolation who continue to ignore the requests to do so will be triggered by the Department of Health, That's at which correct, point yeah. there's a transmission containment. What, what's the trigger point? Do you, what, what, what is the criteria as to when that needs to be enacted? Well, that's uh, set out in uh, the legislation. So um, just turning to point five, it basically states that if at any time the Department of Health is of the view that the incidence or transmission of coronavirus constitutes a serious and imminent threat to public health in Northern Ireland, and the powers conferred by this part of the schedule will be an effective means of delaying or preventing significant further transmission of coronavirus in Northern Ireland. Those are the circumstances in which the Department of Health would make such a declaration. So the, the criteria, the threshold for that is set out specifically in okay. the legislation. So we need to see what is going to be defined as the serious and imminent threat. Yes, and obviously that... there's, there's a message has been issued that we're in the containment phase is now gone and we're now actually in the delay phase. So that's why I'm asking when will we have this serious and an imminent threat that people who have this will actually be enforced to stop doing what they're doing and ignoring advice? I think that'll be a, a, a 
health decision rather yeah. than the justice one. Okay. Um, <coughs> there's no powers contained in this um, to provide the police with the legislation that they need to start enforcing social distancing? Is that something the department has looked at? Um, th this section of the legislation doesn't deal specifically with that because it's focused on basically the containment of um, infected or potentially infected individuals, but there are other parts of the legislation which other colleagues will be more familiar with, which deal with um, uh, management of premises and um, mass groups of people and how, how that's to be managed. And is that fall within DOJ? Maybe that's... That's been taken forward by the Executive Office, that part of the legislation. <coughs> it's in relation to, specifically in relation to mass gatherings, but it also, as Maura says, covers um, premises as well. Okay. Um, so the Executive Office is handling that. Uh, from that, though, will flow a requirement on the police to enforce it. Are you able to provide any information as to how the police are, are going to be able to enforce it? Not at this stage. I am not over the detail of that. Okay. I think, Chair, that'll be an operational matter for the, the Chief Constable. It's not something that the Department would direct on. Okay. Okay. Let me bring in members just on the policing point then. Patsy? Just picking up on that, that point that Moira raised, that it was an operational matter for the police. Uh, the police, and I know this, uh, the police are coming back and saying it's not, it's not an operational matter for them because there isn't a law there which they can enforce. All they can say is, advise, you're, you're not complying with the advice, and that's it. Um, so it probably brings us along to um, what necessary powers are the department considering, or are, is the department uh, uh, being guided by Westminster as to the ultimate sanction, including lockdown, um, could you tell me the process involved in that, please? You're absolutely right that the police can only enforce laws that exist, but uh, the provisions that uh, Doreen was referring to will create the power for them to enforce uh, the provisions that are now going to be contained through the coronavirus bill, which will give, exist, will give them more scope to um, enforce situations where people aren't complying with the, the advice. As for how the government ramps up the response generally to coronavirus, that's not something that will be dealt with through this piece of legislation. Okay, that's not something the Department of Justice would, would act unilaterally on. Okay, right. Thank you, Chair. Doug, thanks, Patsy. Chair, uh, sure, thank you. Um, all right, I, I, on reading this here, it, it talks a lot about the, the police powers. Um, what about immigration officials powers? Will they mirror the police powers? Uh, yeah, it, it includes uh, immigration uh, official powers as well. I haven't referred specifically to those because uh, immigration is an accepted matter, so that's determined by Westminster and uh, applies UK-wide. I, I guess I'm trying to just so to push you to say, I'm, I guess I'm trying to just narrow it down to our very specific circumstances here in Northern Ireland with a large proportion of people moving south to north or north to south. Um, has there anything been put in in particular to that, for example, uh, in order to to restrict movement? <coughs> Sorry if I've missed it on this. Um, just... Again, uh, this is really specifically dealing with uh, the, the management of people who are infected or potentially affected, as opposed to general movement of, of okay. the population. All right, fair, 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 fair enough. Um, uh, and, and the last one, if I can, please. Again, has, is there any thought been put in to trying to increase the resilience in police numbers? Um, I know from um, being able to dial into the Platinum Command uh, calls that are happening on a regular basis, um, the Chief Constable, normally that would just be a matter for the police, but uh, he's um, helpfully agreed that the department can be involved in those calls and uh, a senior representative of the policing board just as part of the efforts to um, ensure good communications at, at this exceptional time. But I'm aware that the police are looking at um, various methods of ensuring that they, they maintain the capability that they require. Um, that may include, for instance, um, looking at better use of other resources like the part-time reserve. Um, but again, it'll be for the Chief Constable to determine that. But I know that kind of thinking is happening. Right, thank you. Thank you, Chair.
Can I just ask on a procedural point, is it a matter for the Chief Constable to decide on the deployment of the Army if that gets to the point in which it's necessary? Is that purely an operational decision for the Chief Constable or is there a political decision making process in that? No, there would be a request made by the Northern Ireland Office if there was a request to the Ministry of Defence to bring in military assistance. Would be the Secretary of State? Uh, the request would be made through Secretary of State, yes. So the Chief Constable would make it through the Secretary of State as the process? I think the Chief Constable, the Department, the Northern Ireland Office would work very closely on that, but um, I haven't seen any indication that we're at that point or that that is being anticipated. In well, hopefully we don't get there, but it's at just the moment, from a procedural point of view. I can't rule that out, but at the moment I, I'm not aware of any intention to deploy military resources. Okay, thank you. Rachel? Um, just one point on the locations within the legislation. It's about um, where people who are suspected of having COVID-19, where are they going to be taken to? Where are those suitable locations? Because it, for me, in reading this, it's not overly clear. Is it police stations? Is it where, where are people going to be held? And my understanding is it would be healthcare facilities. Uh, I don't think we'd be uh, intending to bring infectious people into to police custody unless absolutely essential. Um, but in, in terms of, sorry, just in, we get to that point, because um, I know certainly there has been some movements within Musgrave Police Station to have another floor dedicated to this. So is that been, that has been looked at at the moment in terms of holding people in police custody? Or is it or they, would they then be moved on to healthcare facilities? I, I think if someone's identified as being infected or potentially infected, uh, the priority would be to get them access to the the healthcare assessment treatment that they require as quickly as possible. Um, I know the police will be making um, reasonable precautions within custody suites to prevent transmission within a custody suite if someone attends who is identified. Um, I don't have the detail of exactly how they're doing that, but uh, I know they'll be alive to the, the risk of people coming into the custody population within police stations. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks, Rachel. Paul? Yeah, just on Doug's point, I suppose, uh, about contingencies and bringing in uh, armed personnel, and again, two different trades, police officers, police officers and, and soldiers are completely different uh, roles they do, but may well be down to manpower. Uh, before, the ar before I talk about the army, can I say that there's probably a pool of retired or ex uh, PSNA police officers, part-time reserve uh, retired too, that may well be able to be drawn on and may well volunteer their services. Uh, and also, the army piece, if it is a, if it's a political issue also, which there may well be questions and conundrums around, there, there is a pull, a good resource of uh, reserve forces here in Northern Ireland, from Northern Ireland. Uh, that may be more operationally sound, actually, than, than bringing in maybe units from Scotland, England and Wales. Um, I will know the area, I will know the people, and that could well be used as manpower. Again, two different roles, of course, police officers and soldiers, but it may well help and assist the police with regards to manpower and operation. Uh, is there any thought process or forward planning on, on any of those issues? I think the police have been looking at, you know, particularly recently retired officers. Um, so I think um, that is one option that they, they would be pursuing. Um, uh, I, again, I ha I'm not aware of any intention to look to seek military assistance at this stage. And I think the, the police have said so over the weekend and in social media. Uh, of course, with the reserve forces, you're not only getting infantry, you're getting engineers, you're getting comms, you're getting vehicles, uh, you're getting mechanics. Uh, I think it, it may well be, uh, you know, a way forward in the next couple of weeks. Thank you. Just to tidy up the policing side of it, the collaboration with the guards, has there been the discussions, is there a plan in terms of uh, that kind of cross-border cooperation, including supplementing of uh, resilience and around workforce and so on? Is that something that's being discussed? I'm not aware of any specific discussions around that, um, but I would have thought that um, as for any other challenges that um, affect both parts of the island, there would be the usual good cooperation and communication between uh, the police and, and the guards. 
I know that in the Republic there are similar powers in place to the ones we have here uh, on foot of uh, an amendment that was made last month to the um, relevant legislation in the South, which is the Health Act uh, 1947. That was amended on the 20th of February to add uh, COVID-19 to the list of notifiable notifiable diseases in the Republic, and there are powers in that legislation uh, for the Gardaí to um, assist health professionals in a similar way to, to how this is due to operate in, in the UK. So I would have thought that um, in border areas, yes, if, obviously someone could move across the border, so I would have thought that the um, local forces will be, will be col collaborating and cooperating on that. And the resilience side of it, uh, uh, and we need to look at what the executive legislation is on this, but if we end up having to enforce the social distancing, which hasn't been happening in supermarkets in my own constituency, uh, and if the public continue to ignore that advice, I listened to the Minister for Justice this morning that society needs to respond, but the actual laws, if they're implemented, how will the police ensure that people are actually doing what they're supposed to do? Has there been work with the Department of Justice and the Chief Constable so that that legislation that's being created, you've told us, taken through the Executive Office, if enacted, actually will be operational? Have those discussions been had with the Department? I'm not aware personally of that, but um, I haven't been engaged on the specific powers that the Executive Office are taking forward. Uh, <coughs> OK. Um, anyone else on the policing side of it? Chair, before we leave that point, I know that uh, one of the members had a question about testing kits, oh, and just to say that um, I'm, I'm aware that um, PACE and I are in discussion with a local provider, and they have been in touch with the department seeking approval um, to enter into a direct award contract. Um, we've given approval in principle to that, subject to whatever testing kit is made available, meeting uh, accredited <coughs> standards. Um, and that's on foot of advice that they've received from Central Procurement Directorate that that would represent a reasonable value for money and a, a proper procurement approach. Um, we're not in any way seeking to draw resources away from healthcare staff, obviously. We, we need to be responsible there. So we've been keeping in contact at senior level between the departments uh, to make them aware of uh, the actions the police are taking and ensure that uh, they're content with that. So there is work underway, so I would have thought that um, there could be a uh, contract in place relatively soon to provide for some level of, of testing of officers because I think it is important that it those who are protecting us are protected themselves so they're able to, to exercise their, their job. And it, it links back into the, the resilience of the force and ensuring we have sufficient numbers of police officers to keep everyone safe. Sure. So could just very briefly on that, I take it you don't have any time frame on that yet at all, Maura? No. Um, I think there could be a contract um, very soon. Okay. Um, Again, it's, it's linked in with ensuring that uh, the, the, the kit that is being sourced is properly accredited, yes. but I'm, I'm told that should be happening imminently. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Chair. Um, Rachel, do you want yeah, to Yeah, just very quickly in terms of the level of personal protection equipment that is being issued to the police. Um, is there, I know we were discussing it last Thursday, that there was maybe not enough... Um, and then we're looking to increase supply. Is that is that still ongoing, or has that been sourced? I think that's still ongoing. Um, I, I'm aware of uh, the comments that ACC Todd made when he was here last week, and I know from um, linking in with the police uh, and their planning, that's still a work in progress. Uh, there is, and it's a, I think it's a common challenge across a number of sectors, uh, just access to sufficient levels of, of that sort of equipment. But where they have equipment available, that's being prioritised. They now have um, dedicated teams or identified individuals within each district who are leading on COVID-19. So obviously those officers, I think, would be the, the first to receive any equipment that they do have available. Can I just ask that in terms of the trying to control the movement and the mass gatherings that seem to still be happening, is the department responsible for any potential new punitive measures? Because if we give new legislation to try and stop that, it obviously needs to have some kind of penalty associated with it. Will that fall to the Department of Justice? Um, and I cite examples of fining people who continue to disobey it. And that includes individuals 
um, and businesses, which other countries have now taken on as, a, as an approach? My understanding is that that's already included as part of the legislation. The offences and penalties has already been included. And that's in the executive office. They're taking that aspect yes, off. Yes, in conjunction with colleagues in DOJ. Okay. Um, just on then, I wanted to, to come back to the courts, and then I'm going to come to the issue around deaths at the end. But on the court side of it, um, <coughs> has there been any discussion around the consolidation of? The work that's taken place in the courthouses, does that fall within your area? That would really be a matter for the Office of Lower Chief Justice and he has been issuing various um, updates on the Judiciary NI.UK website which is actually a very useful resource just to keep an eye on what courts are doing. Um, you'll all appreciate it's a very fluid situation. Lower Chief Justice is obviously responsible for the deployment of the Judiciary in Northern Ireland um, and there are some very pragmatic decisions being made about prioritising business and really making sure that courts and tribunals are um, doing what they can do in these very difficult times. Okay. Any other members uh, around the provisions of the, the bill to do with the court's aspect of it and proceedings? If we can go to the issue around the, the death side of it. Um, the registration process, in terms of people who've passed away um, and will pass away, the, the requirement to have that notified, for example, to the local government, is that the Department of Justice or is that Department of Finance? It's Department of Finance, and they have been contributing to the legislation as well in relation to certain measures to um, facilitate that death registration process. Okay, so it's, it's Department of Finance around that. Because I know it's already been an issue in Northern Ireland that a local government had to deal with because they had to, under law, come in and provide a certificate. And then that obviously led to issues for that local authority. <coughs> so there's, there are measures in the, in the legislation which should um, make that easier and once it's passed. OK. Um, are you able to elaborate any further on the procedures around deaths and how we're going to be able to manage that if it's as bad as what's happened elsewhere? So the measures which are being brought in to facilitate the death management process are really just around trying to um, speed up um, the, the system so that we can manage as long as possible um, with burials and cremations. So there's um, powers of direction to um, to allow the councils to direct people to assist with the transportation, um, with with um, the disposal of and storage of human remains if necessary. So we will try to continue with normal burials and cremations until a point where the system is no longer able to cope with that. And then we're looking at um, body storage solutions beyond that. Whenever you say continue with normal burial... Um to a point. How do you do that in the current social distancing? Yeah, um, so because obviously it's an incredibly difficult time because people are dying through other causes, yeah. but because of the situation that we're facing, social distancing needs to be put in place. So w at what point does that again unfortunately need to be enforced? Well, you're probably already aware that Roselawn has already imposed restrictions yeah. there and you can see that that's probably how <coughs> other areas will deal with it as well. Um, when I say normal burials, it's to try and um, facilitate the burial as opposed to facilitate the, the people being able to come along to that as well. Um, obviously be trying to encourage social distancing as much as possible and various council areas will put in place their own measures as they see fit. Whenever you talk about burial um, solutions around keeping people that pass away, are you able to elaborate? In relation to the body storage solution, mm -hmm. um, we already have capacity at the minute for um, 280 bodies if we need to, over and above normal capacity, and we're actively seeking to increase that um, so that if we need to, um, we can store the bodies um, until such times as we're able to facilitate the burial cremation. So obviously we have a slightly different culture here than maybe even in England where it's mm -hmm. two to three days compared to three weeks. Um, uh, so it's around how you accommodate that, but not knowing how far this could go. Uh, and also, uh, at all stages, we want to treat 
the deceased and their families with dignity and respect. So it will be a lot about communicating and making sure that people are very much involved in the process. We'll be looking at the different faith requirements as well and facilitating that as far as possible. But we are in a very different situation now and um, you know, we're, we're looking at a situation where we, we thought we would never have to face and we hoped we would never have to face. So we may have to get to a stage where people's wishes may not be able to be taken into consideration, mm. but that'll be, that'll be a very good reason for, for that. So currently you have capacity um, for 280 bodies and you're actively seeking to increase that capacity. What if you don't get it? We, we are confident that we will be able to increase it. And is that private and public sector provision? Has it went out to the public sector yet? Not yet, but we have been we've been having some um, quite a few discussions. I mean, this is happening right across the UK as well. Yeah. The cabinet officer are leading on this, um, and um, we're confident that we'll be able to secure additional body storage. Okay. Gordon Dunn. Thanks very much. Just on that, the, the registration process will that move away from local government then for the days? I am not over the detail of that because it's the Department yeah. of Finance are taking that forward, but I think that there is um, potentially capacity to do some of it online. Right, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> okay, and just uh, I think we're all very aware it's a highly sensitive issue and we appreciate the way you, you are dealing with it. But as the, the Chair has said, generally people take about three days here. And do you think that will, will, will have to change or may likely change? It may well have to change, just depending on the pressures on, on, on the industry. Um, we're looking at funeral directors, and we're, we're talking closely to them as well about what needs to be put in place. But um, we don't know the numbers of people that are going to be um, off sick, because it's going to affect funeral directors as well as other council staff, and that will all have to be factored into it. So where we can, as I said, we will continue with burials up until the point where the system can no longer cope, and, yeah. and we will get to that point, I imagine. Yeah, I know people are ready this weekend, you know, have had issues uh, that haven't been obviously related directly to the the, re, the problem, but um, there's problems with burials just generally, and church, obviously, church has not been able to meet, and, and all of those issues are causing great concern to people, so we appreciate your efforts, and, and we trust and pray it'll never happen or come to this. Yeah, too, I would share uh, Gordon's views there in, in relation to that and the sentiments. Um, unfortunately, we're facing into a reality that <coughs> none of us this time last year or even a few months ago would have thought we would have been in. But could I ask, now, <coughs> you mentioned Roseland, as far as I know, that's controlled by the, the City Council here. But as you know, there are, now, forgive my ignorance in this, there are numerous graveyards throughout the north that aren't within the control of either local government or any public body for that matter. So <clears throat> can you advise me what um, what sort of coordination of effort is being done with local authorities and indeed churches or anyone else who controls uh, these graveyards to ensure that there will be a coordinated approach towards burials, as, as Gordon and others have already said, and Paul has said, extremely sensitive time for people very, very sensitive time, full of all sorts of emotions. And while at one level we want to make sure that that sensitivity is, is the approach, we want to make sure that there's a corresponding approach right across the whole of the north uh, to this, uh, because you don't want maybe two or three miles down the road one form of burial, whereas up the road there's more uh, what some could interpret as a cold form of burial. Um. There's still a lot of work to be done and a lot of discussions to be had around all of that and what it will look like in practice. Um, I think the, we've certainly been engaging with the local councils in relation to their responsibilities, um, and we're very conscious that it goes much wider than that with all of the, the churches and the, and the other burials which are out there. Um, so discussions are going on, but I, I can't go into the... I mean, I don't know the detail of that right, at okay. this stage. No, no, that's grand. As long as it's been thought about. So Thanks, Chair. Okay, thanks, Pastor Gemma. Just a quick question around the guidance for funeral directors. Will that is that local government responsibility? You know, in terms of the arrangements and stuff for funerals. The local government will have responsibility. They will have the powers of direction to tell okay. them 
you know, to ask them to transport the bodies or whatever, so that that's all contained as part of this legislation. Okay, and there's not a specific guidance or anything around that yet? In relation to handling of bodies? Yeah. So to, uh, in relation to the funeral directors and how they should, yeah. yeah. So the Department of Health have been working on okay. that, um, and as far as I know, there is draft guidance for Okay, okay. that's great, thank you. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Um, it is a difficult subject. Um, we know it's a difficult subject. People need clarity out there as much as we can. In regards to the death management plan, we bury about 16,000 people a year in Northern Ireland. It's my understanding that funeral directors have the capacity to bury up to 30,000 people a year in Northern Ireland within that three to four days. Um, you know, uh, and, and if you look at what the, the health minister is saying is, is possible death numbers, that, that falls within that criteria. I don't think that's the particular issue here. I think the issue is that we've, we've handed this to, to local authorities. Now, the funeral directors are coming to me and they're saying that they need better guidance in regards to the spread of corona in the likes of embalming of bodies. Now, where one um, local authority may well tell funeral directors, you do not have to embalm closed coffins buried within three days but you can go to another local authority which will say no we will embalm we will have an open coffin and we'll still bury within three days in which case you'll get a shift of of, of people so is there not a plan to to take this at a higher level to direct all councils to adhere to one death management plan so that's what um, we've just been talking about, the guidance which the Department of Health are drafting up is in relation to the funeral directors and it's about keeping them safe in relation to what they can and can't do with the bodies and how they should be handled. Um, so there will be that guidance from the Department of Health in relation to that. But, uh, sorry. So the, the, the powers within the legislation, the powers of direction, yeah. are more to do, which the local authorities will use, are more to do with transportation, yeah. the storage and the disposal of, of human remains, as opposed to directing how a funeral should take place. How quickly will that direction come out? How the direction to, to, to undertakers? Will it come out as required or will it come out as a this is the direction and we'll press the button to, to, to instigate that. To the, the direction in relation to the, these powers? The treatment of bodies. The treatment <coughs> of bodies. Um, that's a matter for the Department of Health. Okay. They were actively working on it last week, so okay. I imagine that should be imminent. If it's not already out, it will be. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Yep. Well, just, uh, most people will die in hospitals, so it'll be that indirection there that basically is the critical point between the hospital and the... I'm sure there's a, yeah, I don't know if the coroner's involved at that point, but then I'll be the undertaker, so it'll probably just need to be that direction there. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you. Okay, any other members? Is there any other broader points now, members? Um, we've went through the different aspects um, that each member has covered. Is there any other broader points that members at this stage want to make? Chair, I suppose the thing you've already mentioned is the issue of... Um, I'm already getting messages through there from the public about social distancing and uh, the issue of crowd gathering. That are not a lot of people are not taking it serious, and I know the points have been made. And I think what we would do is underline that the pressure is building for something to be done here within the assembly on those issues. And we appreciate all your work and your efforts in these difficult times. And I think we all need to move towards doing something on those lines. And, and Whatever you can do would be much appreciated, Chair. Okay. Can I thank you? Um, I appreciate it's extraordinary times and um, you all have your own personal situations, which I'm sure vary, and the concerns that that manifests in itself, and you're still having to do your job. Um, and so I don't underestimate the own personal strain that people will have without knowing what they are, because it affects all of us. And I just want to thank you for the work that you're doing uh, and appreciate that, uh, as do the public. Um, so, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members. Um, obviously, there's some there's some points that have been raised around uh, aspects that don't fall within justice. Um, so the the LCM will go through tomorrow. Um, in in terms of the specific justice related elements. Obviously, I, I would want to be in a position to be able to relay a general committee view that we're supportive of these measures, uh, albeit some of them uh, incredibly reluctantly, um, but given the situation that we're in. So I, I would like to get a view from the committee that I can articulate tomorrow, um, that the committee uh, is supportive of the justice-related elements of this. 
Um, there are other things that don't fall within this committee's remit. Um, but in terms of the justice aspect of it, uh, if members are, are willing to indicate a contentment around the justice aspect, we are waiting on the specific prisoner release amendment that we need to see, because obviously that has only happened on Saturday. Um, but in terms of what we've heard, the members want to indicate uh, a position on that, and I'm quite happy to, to go around the table on that if that's needed. I, I start off, I suppose, uh, Chair, I think we would like to send this a message from this committee that we appreciate the work that uh, all these people have done and are doing under extreme pressures. Again, you've highlighted about the everyone will have a family concern. A personal issue. Uh, these people are, are the top of their game. They're the head of their organisations, and uh, this is their time. Uh, I think that has to be relayed. On the actual specifics of the bill, um, I think that uh, needs must in these element these things. You'll not get any more libertarian than me uh, in my politics. But I think for a for a short period of time, these measures will need to be deployed. I think someone has to have the discretion in order to uh, appoint these powers and enact these clauses. Uh, and those people we trust, uh, I'll come down to that. Um, I would be a wee bit worried about the two-year uh, piece. I think a lot of people would be. Um, uh, let's hope that this crisis won't last that long. And maybe this could be repealed much earlier than that. Uh, but we are in extraordinary times. I, I think I've even changed my view on this over the last two weeks or two days when I've seen some behaviour out there. Uh, I think people just don't realise and just won't understand. And I think for those people, this law is what's actually required. Most people will do this sensibly with as much grace as possible. But there'll be the few that will let us all down. So I, I think that has to be relayed. And I think more than ever, I think the executive the assembly has to be united and use whatever powers we have at our disposal in order to keep as many of the population as safe as possible, uh, always treating people with human dignity. Um, so... That's all I want to say, Chair. If that's helpful, I don't yeah, know if no, it, is. it is. It is. I appreciate that, Patsy. Chair, just very briefly, we're, we're in extraordinarily difficult times and those will require extraordinary measures. And it may well be that in the next two or three days we might be back here, um, judging by what Boris Johnson was saying yesterday in, in Westminster. Um, just on Paul's point, I would have had concerns about the two year, but I think the government's tabled in its own amendment at Westminster to bring that to six months. Uh, if I'm picking that up right. Um, so, um, fair play to the staff for being here with us. These are very, very difficult times for the entire community, and uh, whatever measures need to be taken. The recklessness being displayed by some people mm -hmm. is really going to push the government to take more difficult measures, but needs must mm -hmm. in these circumstances. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Rachel? Um, yeah, just to come back on the, the two year thing, would have a very, very big problem with, especially with the, a debate only happening a year in. I think um, certainly there's there's times that these measures are going to have to come into place, but we need to make sure that people are treated with dignity and respect and that human rights are, um, are adhered to. Um, in terms of the specifics of the bill, I certainly would have concern over a bit of a lack of detail that we've been given so far as a committee and about information about what came from the department. But understanding that this is, you know, difficult times and that the landscape is ever changing on a daily, if not hourly basis, um, but certainly there's going to have to measures are going to have to take place. I just would be mindful of, and maybe not for that length of time. Emma, I know it's unfair, me, maybe because you're only here for one week, and <laughs> L Linda, who leads on your party's behalf, yeah. isn't here. But I, I don't want to, to pass, obviously. Yeah. No, it, it's the same basically as whatever else is saying. You know. There are things that I have problems with in the bill, but it needs must, and we are in extraordinary time, so whatever has to be done, mm -hmm. do it. But again, I do have concerns over the two years, but so does everybody else. So. Yeah. Luke? 
Um, Chair, you have my absolute support to go forward um, and say that we support these measures, because I do support these measures. Uh, I, I don't have an issue with the two-year um, uh, length of time, and the reason I don't have an issue with this because this is going to reoccur again next winter. Mm. Um, uh, and anybody who understands how these works and, and uh, will understand that the peak will last for a long time. The two years can be rescinded at any stage when we know it's over. It's there, it's on the shelf, you pick it down as and when you require it. So I do not have a concern with that. In many ways, I think this bill does not go far enough. Um, I think there are other measures that can be put in there. I don't think that people have explored how the military can help. When they see military, they see guns. That's not the case. The military can set up a role one medical facility uh, in Northern Ireland uh, to help with capacity. They can also set up a tented testing centre and man it to add capacity. They can also provide drivers. They can also provide people who helps with making sure that our water supply is not interrupted. Um, I think these, the, these measures in some ways are very uncomfortable, but in other ways I think they need to go a little bit further. Okay. Well, can I thank members for, for making those views uh, known? And can I commend the members for the way they handled that session? It was exemplar, getting to very difficult issues very quickly. And again, as I said to the witnesses, you all have your own personal circumstances, as I do as does our committee staff, uh, and they have been doing a phenomenal job, uh, and everyone is under uh, pressure, but this is where you need to be very clear-eyed and focused as to what we're doing and take decisions in very uh, restricted time frames. So the members have shown a very good example on that, and I want to, to commend you for it. The public really do need to listen. Um, those that are behaving recklessly cannot be tolerated. The, the invasion of some of our tourist destinations at the weekend was appalling. Uh, and that has to stop, uh, and I, I will be giving my full support to whatever measures become necessary in the days ahead for that to stop, um, so that we can uh, minimise the impact that this is going to have on people. So, uh, thank you, members. I'll relay that tomorrow on behalf of the committee. Obviously, you're at liberty to, to speak whenever that issue uh, arises uh, in the chamber. Um, the motion is due to start uh, tomorrow at 10.30. Uh, as soon as we get the prisoner-related aspect of it, the committee will provide that to members so that you that you have it. Um, our next meeting is supposed to be um, uh, on uh, Thursday. Uh, we'll only be dealing with urgent issues. If it becomes clear that there isn't something, there won't be a meeting. I'll have to take that decision. I'll work with Christine on that. Um, so if you can leave that in my hands, um, working with uh, Christine on that, please relay to me if there's issues that members want to be dealt with by the committee so that we can take that into account. Um, but uh, we'll proceed on that basis if members are content. Okay, meeting adjourned. Be room thirty. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room thirty. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room thirty.